right, welcome to the 181st meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Tonight, uh, we're going to be hearing from Mark Russell with a talk about what's new with Ubuntu LTS 1404, otherwise known as Trusty Tar. So, uh, like I said, this is our second time here. We would like to express our, our gratitude for the space. This is really great. Um, thanks to our Bluebird hosts. I'd like to thank, uh, in addition to Bloomberg, who's giving us the space, I'd like to thank our other sponsors, IBM, Canonical, Brand War Group, Google, and O'Reilly Media for their continued support. Uh, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who contributed greatly over the years to continue to do so. Uh, thanks, everyone. All right, well, let's uh, welcome Mark Russell to tell us what's new in Ubuntu 1404. Trusty Tar, take it away. And I, as far as I can tell, anything specific I'm on the hook to talk about is uh, the pressing question is what is the power of this world? So then, and then I think the rest of it I'm going to talk about it in the I'm sorry. Um, so, the tar is a, uh, there's three species. There are three species of large Asian ungulates related to the wild goat. I never guess where I set up to. Um, I, but I even checked the pronunciation. There's a video out there on YouTube that tells you how to say ungulate or ungulate. Sorry. So, uh, so back to me. I'm a technical account manager for Canonical. Um, I've been there for four years. Uh, before that, I supported uh, Susan Linux Enterprise for developed technical support. And for that, I was on the other side of the tent, um, getting angry at software companies and, and working with a lot of different technologies, including Netrider and other unspeakable today. So, I'm the point of contact for large customers to support. I support customers that have uh, large desktop fleets, uh, server clusters, uh, open stack deployments, uh, smaller like Android, and it would be 600 Android developers who are all doing their development on the web So different things. Um, you know, sometimes I'm triaging, sometimes, uh, sometimes the customer gives me such a good bug report I don't need to, and it's more a matter of like trying to get their feature requests in, show them a roadmap, uh, work with engineering, reach across maybe the hardware enabling people, whatever it takes for, for the end customer. Uh, you may also know me from the extern uh, I'm, 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 I'm the offside of DevOps, not a developer at all. So that was probably a one line packaging change. Uh, instead of 32 bit test clients, because I had an extern, looking for that extern. Uh, but you know, so some days working at Distro is a lot of fun. Um, seeing how things work on the inside, although a lot of our discussions and our processes out in the open. Um, you know, it's pretty fun. Some days, some days you, you find yourself in the change log, and then other days when you're copying and pasting something from a launchpad bug into the Salesforce, Salesforce you know, I don't want to back out. Um, so we do have an agenda besides init demons. Um, we'll talk about the thing that unites all these bunch of players. <coughs> Uh, hardware support, kernel, things that apply beyond a bunch of course. Uh, desktop, the shiny mobile, and uh, server and cloud. Kind of look at the same way, in some ways. So, uh, these are all the official flavors. There's other derivatives out there, um, like Linux Mint. These are the official uh, sort of sanctioned flavors. And what does that mean? Uh, the only ones you can buy commercial support for are, uh, you know, of course, the most huge. I left that look off this page. Uh, <laughs> uh, she led in the Chinese edition. Uh, so we don't have formal commercial support for the others, but three of them, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, and Keelan, are have LTS status for five years. So what does that mean? It's not commercially supported. Support's um, an interesting term, actually, is what I do. So there's a lot of different interpretations of what it means to be supported. When I say I'm talking about two things that largely overlap. One is, yes, commercial support. Uh, uh, you know, but I'm not here to sell you, help sell you support on this. You know, please feel free to come to me after I get your card. But uh, I mean supported by the platform, by the Ubuntu engineering community, the, the core devs, um, and especially the security team. I'll talk about that later. It's really important. Uh, so that means that we're not going to stomp over there uh, Ubuntu's packages or any of them. The other ones, by the way, have three-year LTS support. So our changes won't break any of the packages that they care about. If we don't, it also means the stuff that's in main of that provides security security which, uh, which is even 
So I had this slide up here, just you know, some, some features we picked out from, from the kernel, uh, mostly with Brian. Um, this is stuff that applies to you know, Linux in general. We're running a 313 kernel in, uh, in 14.04. So you know, TCP fast open, which is in the kernel for several releases, but now it's on enabled by default. I had customer that might say this uh, support the kernel that's arrived. If you want to really find out more, I can recommend kernel and uh, you can read the readme and, and go up and figure out some bits of the thing with some context around it. They call it you know, human readable really release sense. Um, I recommend it a lot. And, then, and the other thing is, it is it's worth keeping up with. You know, with the two to three month release cycle, there's no moments like in you know, out of the past where I can't wait till this version comes out. You know, every now and then there's a big drop, there's a little drop, there's a little bit of something all the time, it just kind of evolves. So those little changes do add up though after a while. Um, uh, some logo slides here for a reason. Some of these people are in our technical partner program, which I mentioned just because the things that come out of that, um, the bug fixes and enablement that goes into that, those tend to do RF and kernel and upstream. So there, there is no separate uh, fragment disks, and you don't need to get a private PDA from us for that stuff. So I'm mentioning it as a commercial thing, but at the other hand, I think it benefits everyone. Um, and platform support. So we have uh, full support for 64 bit ARM on this release. Uh, and that includes Zen KDM, which is an open stack with the ARM. Uh, and what's really interesting to me, which I didn't check out all the press yet, is the support for Power 8. IDM is apparently making a big push and is uh, a little tired of uh, only having one vendor, so they're uh, they're pushing, and I, I don't know what prices are, I don't know what the quad is per dollar, but I can see the high end specs for the Power 8 and something like well, for 96 red, this one of the same memory bandwidth, that's three times themselves. And uh, yeah, it, it's a ridiculous processor. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's also uh, keeps the server room warm. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have a uh, you know mobile on touch, which right now the original support platform is still the Nexus 4, Nexus 7, 2013 edition, which is why I don't have any shiny but touch that one with me. And uh, Nexus 10 tablet. Um, there are recipes in the web. This, wow, this slide, this is a really important slide, um, and it, it might apply to you a lot of people here in different ways. I have trouble explaining this. I've had people, uh, uh, I've had people uh, try to explain the hardware enablement support cycle inside the company to people who don't get it. You know, the customers have to know uh, One of the things I'd like to see better in this cycle is uh, better messaging and explanation. So, what we have here is Mobile for OTS, uh, precise, came with the 3.2 kernel. So let's see here is one of the dot releases. Um, you know, comparable to a support pattern. Really, you just you don't have to install anything, right? You just keep upgrading and at some point you're at 12.4.1. Um, there was no hardware enabling pack when 12.4.1 came out, but when 12.4.2 came out, that lines up with here, which is the release of 12.10, which is on the 3.5 kernel. At that point, you have the option to install a backport kernel. Uh, and there's a backport next stack. Right, you know, these, uh, the way the Linux driver model works, and that, you know, you need the only kernel to get support for a lot of things. So, if you stick with an LTS, which you want people to do, um, you need some sort of hardware enablement in there, uh, or else you might not even be able to do. And so forth. So, with 13.4, we've got the 3.8 kernel, 3.11, and Trusty comes with 3.13. What's hard to describe is this line right. This line right here is very important. This is coming up on August 7th. Um, that is when support for these three kernels goes away. And with it, you're not going to be automatically operated. Uh, you may not even be aware that you're opted into a backport kernel because you may have installed from 12.4.2 or up, which will just automatically give you the backport kernel. So just be aware of that. You don't have to switch. I don't know if you've heard, but a year or so ago, we switched from 18 months of support for a non lts release to nine months. Um, this is great, the hobbyist who's going to be upgrading every six months anyway, they've got a leeway to upgrade. It doesn't make sense for the corporations. Uh, most groups don't want to have a you know, that sort of lifespan on their installs. We have one to keep people secure. So, uh, the, uh, once you opt in though, so the support for actually, okay, it's technically wrong because it's just enabled this cycle, so could just pretend this is true. Support for Quantum, which actually just ended, should have ended nine months, over nine months ago. The kernel would still go on until this point. 
this point is the, is the first dot release of 1404. So when 1404.1 comes out, mm -hmm. these kernels lose support and you have two choices. 13, uh, 313 and 32. Um, and that goes that goes to the same with, uh, with the X stack. So it's interesting in the desktop. Um, there were some high hopes, I think, to get the convergence and to get the Unity 8 ready for 1404. Uh, didn't make it. Uh, you know, the, we, we have a goal, but we care about users enough that the, 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 the experience wasn't going to cut it. It wasn't going to handle your old X uh, app properly. You couldn't do what you could do before the hiccups were back. The quality wasn't there yet. The functionality wasn't there. Um, which is good news for people like stability. That means the compies and XOR, uh, the, the traditional the bunch of desktop stack that's supported, will be a first class citizen support for five more years. Uh, also, personally, I, you know, uh, Unity can be a bit controversial. Some people like it, some people hate it. A lot of people probably haven't tried it in a while either. Um, it looks about the same, it acts about the same. The differences are sort of subtle. I can't put my finger exactly on, on all the changes. I just know that after about 12.10, it worked better on weaker, uh, weaker graphics cards, more stable, it crashed less. It just seemed to work. Subtly better at help ads if you think you're stuck on a precise. And so if you want to lead to uh, 1404, I'd say check it out if you move to another desktop in the meanwhile, give it another look, try it for a few days. Um, yeah, you know, I'm happy with it, but I'm pretty biased. Um, it has a return of, as some people hate the, you know, the Mac style menu bar at the top. Uh, it's still that by default, but there's an option where you can change it and it goes into the window and change the menu. I like the old option, right? You have this infinite walkability. You can never miss the top of the screen. On the flip side of the 30 inch water, that can actually be really far away. Um, there's, other, there's other, you know, some other stuff from 14.4 is better high res uh, slice support. I haven't tried it. Um, if you have, um, if you give it a shot. Let me know. I'm curious. And I did have a customer ask about it. And since they've been working with it, they haven't had any further complaints. But supporting high DPI can be a bit of a challenge. Every toolkit does it differently. Um, our KDE is actually pretty easy and integrated. But you're still going to have LibreOffice. It doesn't use anybody's widget. So everybody's got their own scaling approach and uh, can be a bit ugly. Um, but let's get to the shiny. Um, this is Unity 8. Uh, speaking of opinionated decisions, you ever wonder why you can't move the Unity launcher in, on the PC? That's why. Because it has to, it has to be the same theme. Well, so a lot of these plans were, were laid earlier. Um, so you may have heard of the Ubuntu Edge campaign. Um, that was that was pretty exciting for a little while. Um, it was a Indiegogo uh, attempt to raise thirty-two million dollars in a month to create a very high end phone. Uh, or at least, you know, whatever the latest multi-core processor was coming out around now, it probably would have gone to anything more. Four gigs of RAM, one hundred twenty-eight gigs storage, silicon anode technology battery that allowed us to squeeze more bits in there, and the, Sort of the most strangest esoteric thing was the sapphire crystal streak. Would it shatter more? You can't scratch it unless you have, unless you have a diamond in it, but would it have been easier to break? Who knows? We were just going to see if there was a market for it to try it out. Um, it was pretty exciting. It fell well short of its goals. Um, our friends here at Bloomberg actually pledged $80,000 as part of it to buy 115 of them with support. Um, that would have been a funny panel. Um, thanks, guys. Well, I think we can hopefully all enjoy the business press. But we can move on to actual real, soon now, soon to be shipping bones. These are the first two. Um, they're from, uh, one's from BQ, which is a Spanish phone manufacturer. Um, it's kind of a, maybe a mid-range quad four, a seven at 1.2. It's got a 286 power VR 3D, a gig of RAM, 16 gigs of storage. Well, that's what we believe it's gonna be. That's the same model that's running Android now. I don't really have anything out there that you can't find on, on Kubota or other rumor sites. Um, but that should need to be about the specs. And the MX3 is a Samsung A4 beast with five inch screen, uh, three core GPU, two gigs of RAM, different sizes, and the camera and everything. So what is running on the launch, what will be running on the launch hardware well, is now is, is Unity 8. So what I'm differentiating with Unity 7 is the desktop interface, actually. I kind of use that term generically, although it was version 6, version 5. But Unity 8 is the converged platform is running on the, the mere uh, desktop compositor um, and extra replacements and that works well on handheld the tablet size and below. Not ready for desktop apps. 
Uh, there are some, you know, one thing that sort of looked up for me actually was the fact that, uh, you know, you're going to have an issue with the app ecosystem. Um, obviously, that's the biggest thing. How are you going to get it out of the application? I do like the selection of the stuff that's built in. There are some things that are believed to play in the first <laughs> release, which is between VLC, uh, LastPass, which I personally couldn't be able to live without, GrooveShark, 8Tracks, Weather Channel, Everdome, so. And people are adding all the time, so we'll see how that goes. Maybe it will be enough to get functioning. A lot of people have been dog booting it inside the company. I've been able to set stuff that that's not really my job. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and, and anyway, some other things have been in multiple support, mobile SIM card, geolocation, alarm support, push notification. So some of those things that just rattle off, they're pretty fundamental phone features. So you can still see you know, the same reason, but. Uh, it be really interesting to see how the devices uh, when they come out, I think. Hope, I assume there will be unlocked versions. They really actually want the enthusiast, the person who's motivated to check out something besides Apple or, or Android. Um, it probably won't be a mistake with the app support where you want a massive rollout from a, for a Verizon. If they get a certain percent of returns, you're done. They're never calling you back. Um, so we'd actually like people who will, who will put up with a little more adventure um, to give us feedback and keep working. So, since I don't have a demo for you, I'm a flashy uh, animator otherwise, I figured this is a good idea to talk about some of the technical differences on the tablet and, and phone. Now, there's a framework. The frameworks that are supported for the, for the mobile apps, and by the way, when I say mobile apps, the way that they're actually going to work, in the end, is that you know which form factor you're on. So the apps will have different interfaces for them. It's not going to be just a blown up version. A uh, phone version is going to have a desktop interface, and depending on what format you load the application, that's the idea. Go support QT QML API uh, with some uh, extensions called the Go to UI Toolkit. HTML5 apps and uh, Apache Cordova 3.3 or higher, which uh, which underlies uh, phone gap. Um, no. What else works through this framework version? So I guess you can really just kind of all runtime. So if you have an app that's written for Ubuntu SDK then it'll continue to be able to call that framework in runtime and work even if the user's download the 1404 framework. Um, and there's an SDK that builds UML or HTML5, and you can build click packages and cross compile them for different devices. Click packages. Um, you might not have heard of that because what we really need is another package. <laughs> but we do. There's a reason. Uh, you know these app stores that built up really rapidly thousands of apps. They do some quality checking and they do some inspection, but they really the process. Those two stores are very busy. They process an enormous number of apps. Uh, how can you trust? How can you really embed it in hundreds of thousands of apps? Well, you don't exactly do sandbox the heck out of them. And and that's what we need to do. And we, you know, one. Really big reason we can't do that with dev, uh, with dpackage or RPM and with maintainer scripts. We need to be able to install the applications. So that's not happening. Um, I thought I'd just show this. I thought it was interesting. This is the entire met metadata you need for a quick package. It's pretty simple. There's a manifest.json and your name, you know, your app.json. Um, you can see it's just got some metadata, part of the framework that you are that the app is written for. Um, author, version, title. These hooks are important. Everything runs in an app armor profile as well. So the app armor is an app armor profile for each app, and that has a lot of the sandboxing. That's the major component there. And there's the desktop launcher icon. This myapp.json uh, is kind of like what features you can enable. This says network, networking, but it could say location, it could say camera, whatever permissions you've given the app. But otherwise, the app can only write to its own private directory. So that makes the packages extremely safe, quick to review. Um, the, uh, the review is, I think, 100% automated three hours after uh, submitting your app to uh, through our process. It's online, available to anybody using the touch. touch. Um, Image-based updates. This is, yeah, it's kind of what you think it is. Um, I, I have some interesting mixed feelings on it. It should be interesting when we get to convergence. So the idea is to first have a base system that contains the lowest common denominator and have most of the system running on the exact same bits on every device. 
the package, the format has, has the ability to uh, take multiple files. There might be some vendor device specific bits. Uh, right now, it does a full system um, system image, uh, but the possibility is there to make it um, a delta base to, to reduce the size. Now, why are you doing that? Well, you know, you're running it on you're running on your ARM power phone. So, if you actually had to run your D package, but the, hopefully there's a couple parts <laughs> that you have to that D package. But there, um, you, you know, if you actually ran through all those installs and all that processing power on your phone, you're going to kill it. Um, so do it server side, maybe just the, the transfer, and also having them split up, having a separation between the apps, the system, and your user data makes for an easy way. Uh, it's a ton of information. It's all at developer.ogi.com, and on, and there's links on. Um, wiki.ogi.com, but just go to developer and start there. I'll we'll back up my reasoning about uh, the package, but later. Um, if you want to check out something that's way too early to really check out on the desktop, and you're running open source drivers, uh, because it requires kernel mode setting, uh, you can try it. You don't even actually have to add a PPA. Um, it, I would say just flat out failed launch on my Divi Finder is Power Machine, and I got something out of it on this Intel laptop. So. Strictly a preview, strictly, ooh, look, it's not actual work. Um, ooh, there's a lot of work to do. Check it out. But I think if you keep updating the app, you should be able to follow the progress. Um, it does also, uh, oh, and they're talking about there's also a possibility of doing a flavor for, I don't know if that will arrive by the next cycle or not, but having a separate version of those two that actually has a Unity 8 by default for adventures folks. So, but okay. we'll move on from client stuff. We kind of now we even we've deprecated the term desktop. Uh, it's all clients. So whether that's you know that that's the model of uh, conversions, that's where we're headed. So yeah, it's just a different core practice for client. Um, I enjoy the term so quite a bit. So. Neat logo slide. Um, this is just some of the. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a laundry list, or, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll run through it here. Um, some interesting things. New name is Nginx. Um, I, I told you before why it's really important to be named, or why it's a great benefit. Uh, this is a great thing. It's uh, it'll be packaged the way Debian does in case you're used to Nginx full or Nginx captures from the upstream. Um, those are not going to be packaged under Debian 3 software guidelines, so we're not packaging them. But uh, we give you just the modules that come straight from the Nginx upstream. Python 3, the eternal topic. I agree you, yes, there is you know, full conversion to Python 3. Um, I want to take a note, because I think customers ask me about this slightly worried. The, word, the idea is that Python 3 is the default. Um, you can go and install them. I don't see a time in the future. In fact, I don't see a date in someday where they're going to take, they're not taking Python 2 out of the repository, is all I'm saying. They do want to get it off the CD. But it's fine. All that is is a base install. Uh, right now, I think there's probably still a few dependencies left that haven't been converted. Ah, upstart. Uh, kind of bittersweet. Oh, no, I'll do Puppet real quick. I'm not a huge Puppet. I don't know it very well. What's important, though, is that it does separate the changes from Puppet 3 to Puppet 2. So don't just have to get upgraded and expect everything to work. You might want to check that out. Um, upstart. So it's uh, I was big. I'm a big upstart fan. Well, I've always liked it. And then we can talk about it later. I'm actually pretty eager to talk about the demons, but it's over. Um, some of you may have heard there was a little bit of a Debian thread, 12, 14, 700, 800 messages about what should be the default init system of Debian. And uh, system D won't carry the day, so they're not going to tell you what to do with South Force, but we know basically that's going to be the default. That's our rock. Uh, what you would indebt it to Debian, that's what we base ourselves on. So, uh, you know, we're not going to fight upstream anymore, I think. If I'm not mistaken, that leaves Chrome OS as the last real upstart distribution. See, now I want to tell you why it's actually a kind of a pure expectation. That, uh, so, System D, um, there are packages available for trusting now. There's a PPA, Marketit, these packages available. It pulls in a new uh, network manager and like DM, if we need to start early. Uh, but it's co installable. In fact, when you install it, it pulls those in, but it doesn't actually change your default init. You'd have to change it to current command line and it equals or reconfigure your probe. So I don't know if I want to say I haven't tried it, so I don't know if I want to say it's like safe, but the packages are there to try out. Um, 
no date on the conversion, but I'd be pretty shocked. I, I would put money on it's done before the next LCS. Um, it's just an in-system, it's not something you tear out. I would also be shocked if it was in 1410 as a default. PHP 5, apparently there are also big breaking changes for people who are concerned uh, from 5.3. There are also 5.4 and 5.6 PPAs available. Ruby is up to 1.9, uh, so I'm going to look at that 1.9, and Utopian, or Dr. Utopian, is on 2.1 right, right now, they're still in development. Uh, for people who care about Ruby versions, check it out. Uh, 1.87 is dedicated. Apache 2.4, uh, the long awaited, uh, the word is that the performance is greatly improved, certainly over 2.2, for people who are kind of feeling that it was time to give in to Nginx. Um, give 2.4 another shot, uh, check it out. I can't vouch for it directly, but um, there seems to be a lot of excitement around it. There's also some packaging changes there. They changed the default root document. It's also be aware of your upgrading, so look for uh, look through the reasons I know. My sequel support is at 5.5 .5 as in precise. Uh, 5.6 is available in universe as Arcona and MariaDB 5.5. Um, let me know. Uh, I don't know what exactly the reason why 5.6 isn't in there. Um, it, may, it may be that it tells the 5.5 has been around a bit longer, it's stable, it's mature, but make your voices known if there's issues that, you know, that are important to you. Um, I don't think there's just a lot of feedback and, and pent up demand to get the 5.6. Uh, and all the leading cool kids stuff. Um, <laughs> Docker IO is in, is in uh, Maine, actually. I was really surprised that that was quick. Uh, we might be the first distro that offers a commercial support for Docker, um, at least so far. Um, Vagrant is in universe, but I'll get to why I'm putting it up there. We're big fans of LXC, actually, we kind of lead the upstream effort um, on that. Um, another, another container technology. And Docker IO is uh, 0.9 in Trusty and well, 11 is in Universe. What's interesting about Docker and Vagrant, the reason I want to tie that together, is they both also have official images now. When they started out, they were uh, made by the makers or people, individuals um, uploading them, but they're now official supported bunch of images for Docker and Vagrant. Um, I did also want to just throw in, I, I saw a fantastic talk on containers. Um, that's uh, the OpenStack Summit last week that I was lucky enough to go to. James Bottom, a uh, pretty well known kernel maintainer, had a fantastic talk on uh, YouTube, uh, OpenStack Foundation. Fantastic talk on containers. Um, it's really interesting. There are two different takes. Um, they're really all kind of using the same thing. Docker is based on LXC now. They might move to their own library. But what's, what's interesting about containers is you don't actually need either one. You can construct one. By hand. I mean, a container is it's all kernel calls. It's kernel namespaces for IPC mount network, uh, in namespace. It's isolation with C groups, um, SE Linux or App Armor policies, SecCom policies. It's a combination of those to sandbox them off. So if you want to play a little bit more with the internals of how um, containers work, or you want a little more control over that, uh, LXC is really interesting. Um, if you just want to get up and running, uh, you know, Docker get halfway down the page and you're, you're already fine. Uh, it's really around that. It's fantastic. Um, and LXC has reached production, what they call 1.0 and production ready status. Um, one of the bigger features that is that um, you're now fully unprivileged containers. So users can start containers on their own. There is API binding for, official API binding for uh, Lua and Python uh, and Go and Ruby out of the tree. There's uh, additional features for snapshotting as well, and you can base it on ButterFS, EFS, and uh, AUFS, mobile AFS, and these devices. Pretty, pretty collection of stuff. Um, speaking of uh, official images, um, these are our these are partners, and there's more coming. Um, the certified public cloud platform who publish images aggressively and have been doing so from your back on AWS. Um, those are the ones that you know, you're, you know that you're getting the official, our official certified releases. Uh, but that list will will continue. So, cloud providers, all right, I'm going to keep this pretty quick, it's not a Juju demo, but uh, we'll talk about Juju real quick. Um, the, the short version is, why is it not, it's not a configuration management system, it's service orchestration, and the difference there is that a configuration system tends to, the atomic unit is the machine, 
and this is the unit, the first class citizen is the service, and everything's wrapped around it, and that's the charm that is on the manifest or playbook. Um, the charm can be written in any language. You can actually use a configuration management system underneath it. You can orchestrate how services connect to each other um, and implement that in your public charm, your chef charm, in Python, in uh, the binary, um, wherever you like. There's no trigger license agreement to write charms. Uh, you can write them how you want, write them in any language. Uh, which is, you know, it's actually almost too much trust. So, Juju has a notion of machine providers. So there's machine providers for <laughs> Alex C, Amazon, Azure, Join, HP5, everybody who's on that list, um, but also in addition to that, Alex C. So you can actually take the same charms, install something on the <coughs> container to try it out, turn it to your OpenStack private cloud, maybe to go to another level of testing, and then when you're ready to spend money on it, without really changing anything, put it on Amazon or uh, or Azure or HP Cloud. One of the machine providers is Mass. Metal as a service. As a service. Um, so that's our deployment, bare metal deployment uh, product. Uh, you actually run it, you treat everything like a cloud. When I mean by server and cloud being the same, I mean really the same. Like the cloud images, you, you pull down mass images from the same repository, it runs the cloud in it, it feeds information to the cloud in it. And you're treating your hardware. Uh, you're treating your hardware like like a like a virtualization tool. Um, you know, we don't really care anymore that, that the database server is in rack three, you know, two slots down. You just care that has enough processing power you want your constraints. Just like you ordered and one large on Amazon, um, you might want to order whatever flavors you want to set up on your internal metal cloud. Not quite as elastic. In reality, sometimes you don't just care about. Sometimes I just want it on that machine. Um, it can take care of that. You can use tags. You can the how you want. Um, and it uses an image-based install, so it's very it's very quick. It's not running the whole uh, deep Debian installer deep package routine. You can control the machine, you fire it up at IPMI, CIM, WEEM, Intel, AMT, any base board technology uh, that you want can you know, control the power, fire them up when needed, it'll recommission them. Um, actually, at uh, Mark's keynote, uh, you know, the other part uh, at OpenStack Summit, they, they debuted a plastic as a service, which uh, we'll get to the machine they used on, but they basically just had a machine and it just had a button and it, it had wake on land, but you know, wake on land is really not even worth trying at the time. Um, so they hooked up a Lego Mindstorm to some Star Wars figures that just press the one off, and it works. Um, a, a mass diagram. If anybody's looked at a diagram of internal cloud, of uh, private cloud with deep villages, this looks like a cloud controller. And this is your compute node, and these are your VMs. And that's really the semantics that we're trying to use to match your, uh, match your data center. So these all, by the way, all these services can be on the same box. You don't need three VMs to try this out. Um, they can be co-installed. But you have a region controller. You need to scale out the different data centers. It really makes it easier if you can let it run uh, DHCP on that button. And here's some odds and ends. Um, this one's kind of neat. I uh, never really thought about it that much before, but the pseudo random number generator CD. Um, it's actually kind of a problem on cloud. Um, how, does, how does a machine get built up on an entry level? Um, so it's hardware ends. Uh, mouse movement, key movement, maybe fan speed, I mean, any inputs they can find to make the pool, uh, make the entropy pool higher. The other thing you do is you save, you really, you save your good random seed on reboot. You'll get Etsy in it, you read in my head, there's the save as a script that saves the seed. What about a cloud instance? You may never reboot it. Um, you may, it may just bootstrap itself, run, and then the next time you reboot it again. What's worse, you might be digging from the same image that has the same seed. So, you know, it's not a high chance, but it's out there that, that those SSH keys could be hacked uh, because the level of entropy is predictably too low and there's some sort of signature in that. This is the oh, I'm leading up to the key point. What happens frequently when you're starting a random cloud instance? It generates SSH keys early in boots. So that's a problem on cloud instances. So we have uh, on 1404 on all the cloud instances now, we have Polly, which basically is a service, is, a, is an app that goes out to um, you know, a good entropy pool and so it's not just SSH keys that matters. It matters on TCP sequence numbers, UUIDs, EM trick keys, um, all that stuff, right? Um, so Polity basically takes from an entropy pool, uh, for example, entropy.com. 
uh, you don't trust us, set up your own. There's also a part, a part of the package Colin, which is entropy as a service, and you can share your own pool between machines and pass it off. And in a way, it's not entropy as a service, it's the ability to pick a better way to see, but uh, that's actually whoosh, what we get past that point for me. Um, Cloud data updates, nothing too exciting, except for I like to keep my data. Um, Vendor data support is just like there's uh, on the AWS, you have know, metadata support, right? So you can, you can curl from the service and find out information about your instance. That's my IP, my network setup, uh, devices, attached, attached storage. Um, the vendor data is if somebody wanted to have another source of independent data, maybe a cloud provider or a business that wanted to take the, take the pure Ubuntu image but inject something else somehow. And then you have the data, which is how you want stuff to be able to. Keep my data now me. Um, this is key. So keep my data is a, is a package that takes all your F-syncs and just wraps them to depth hell. There are no options. Um, the reason why, uh, so deep, this is where we get the deep package. Deep package doesn't have a database. RPM's got a perfect DB and it runs it faster. But deep package is all file-based and it's scanning them, it's scanning them constantly. There is a decent, you know, there's an elevated chance of screwing up your system if you lose power during, um, during a large deep package app transaction. So it syncs constantly. Um, if you've ever wondered why it was taking so long, that is wrong. Um, but let's say you're building a true code. Let's say you're bootstrapping a cloud instance. Unless it finishes installing all those packages, who cares? Throw it away. So that's exactly what it is. It's enabled on bootstrap just to get a faster bootstrap. So when you're doing your cloud and install and specifying all the packages that you want pre-installed, it goes a bit faster. Uh, Hurt in, which is for Hurt installer, is a fast path installer, which again is using, it's I don't think it's used outside of mass and, and um, that much yet, but it certainly could be uh, because it's just a uh, image-based um, for mass. It makes, it makes basically setting up these clouds really fast. So simple streams is weird, but I just decided to put this in there. I thought this might fall under news you can use for some people. Um, it's a simple data format, um, client and Python library that parses a line. I'll show you the commands here. There's almost no documentation. There's no end page. Even the dash H is pretty shaky. Uh, I think you kind of blog post. It's normally like for an open source project, you know, at least somebody wrote a blog post. But I, I bang my head around, you know, for a few minutes and played with it, and at least got this one. This is an interesting one. This, this command will return a JSON formatted, machine readable uh, document of all of our current cloud instances on every public cloud, region, version, and everything. So a UK for you might be you want to make sure you're always running on the latest Ubuntu image. Um, you could easily script that rather than, you know, popping over to our website and getting the right AMI number and making sure you update your scripts. Um, you know, you might be using it like seeing your laptop and again, you want to, you could use these uh, mirror, there's a mirror and there's a sync command. Those ones I kind of, I was not going to spend any more time on, but if you wanted to have an archive of how of images local, the, the tools are there, documentation, for coming. So don't worry about it. Actually, this does show up pretty well. Um, moving on to uh, private cloud stuff, um, which I have a lot of fun with. This is, a, this is just a document, a conceptual <laughs> diagram of your basic you know, frills. Uh, cloud is pretty much as Amazon defined it. Uh, object storage, image, images, an image service, an image registry you can look up, look and launch that you run on compute, that you attach to block storage, you have a network service, a GUI dashboard, and an identity store tying it all together. Um, well, let's talk about OpenStack. We do feature it a lot. It's, it's a project outside of a bunch of, but it's a, it's a big part of the Discord now. Um, it's a, it's the, probably the fastest growing open source project in history. Uh, the code base is now comparable to Linux kernel. The number of contributors, the commit rate actually uh, in February, uh, went higher for OpenStack than the Linux kernel. So it is a massive project that is mostly sponsored by uh, paid developers from various corporations working together to take, because they have to band together against you know the 800 pound gorilla. I've never heard this story of action before. Um, but it's got it's gotten really fast, and it seems like everybody's sort of uh, separate. I put a logical diagram up of it though, and it would, this this is nothing. This is. Uh, this is child play, the actual components and how they tie together. It's a mess to install. Um, 
who's pretty typical still. Um, just to give you an idea, because um, I could really, I could go on and on on this, but to give you an idea of like the maturity level of where it's at, um, we're actually seeing a lot more boring new features, which is good. Um, you know, some, uh, there's stuff toward, at the guide towards operators. Uh, originally, every new version of OpenStack was a rip and replace job, but there was, you, were, you were just, you're just screwed. You are rebooted, um, and your instances are going away. Um, so something that landed is like your cloud controller services can actually be upgraded while the computer is running an old version, and then you can choose to flip the switch later. Um, that's the big step. This is we're getting there towards um, taking care of the actual end users where the rubber meets the road. Uh, instead of just testing everything out on DevStack, if you're familiar, and seeing how it works perfectly on your one machine and containers, but um, the reality of operating it is there. So some other things, um, things like anti-affinity scheduling. When you have a bunch of instances and you have one particular type of instance in your app that is going to really crank the CPU and just want to make sure that they're not on the same piece of hardware. So you might want an anti-affinity rule in your scheduler. Um, there's quality of service in blocks of root now. You can set up tiers of storage. You know, you have your gold, silver, silver, gold, platinum tiers, your SSSD mixed and whatever. You can retype a volume so a customer could, or an end user can choose to like, okay, I want the expensive drives now. Um, and they can retype their volume. Um, and that's with Cinder. Cinder is an interesting project. That's the, the block storage service. Um, they've all got their code name. Um, it's got, you can support the MDK files, NFS, your three pars, your, your net apps. It can be plugged into a lot of things. SAP could be the back end. Uh, Gluster could be the back end as well. Um, you know, the second general, there's a lot of pluggable, there's a lot of pluggable choices. You know, if you use the hypervisor you want, um, I have a direct customer that uses VMware as their, as their hypervisor. Um, it seemed to be pretty expensive, but hey, it does work. Um, APMs and um, your preference, uh, everything's pluggable on the storage side as well, and networking. Um, in any case, getting back to the distro, I'm working for feeling myself in. The Ubuntu Cloud Archive is how we support that. Um, in the, kind of in the same way the kernel moves too fast, right? If the kernel enables too much, it, it moves too fast, uh, you need, you can't just stay on an LTS for that long without <coughs> some sort of backporting. That's what we had the Ubuntu Cloud Archive for. So this is precise. So if you had precise, um, it came with Essence, which just like 3.2 is not something I would really recommend you run now. Um, you could, they backported via this, um, uh, it's just like another archive, it's like adding a PPA. Um, any dependencies like libpert or QEMU are, are, are compiled in it and it's fully supported. Um, so if you wanted Icehouse uh, on Precise, you can do that. So the, the, on the LTS, you'll be able to get the new one on Precise and the new one on the current release. There's an overlap. So this chart probably reminds you of an earlier chart. Um, this would be the support cycle for uh, for OpenStack releases. And the same thing, pretty hard to describe. Well, they're supported from between nine, you know, nine months, 36 months, five years. Um, but uh, you have the chart, it's not too, too bad. One thing I think about some of the tech clustering stuff, um, it can sometimes be a pain to figure it out and play around with it at home by yourself. Uh, you know, you do KDM, you do feel like you do something in translation always that from real hardware to commercialize. Um, so it can be a very real entry to play around with stuff. You know, Docker caught fire and had particles on it constantly. But, you, know, just, you just get it going on one machine, it does what you want to do, and people suddenly use data the right away. Um, it takes a little, a little higher barrier to entry to work on a cluster. So um, for that reason, not that we're becoming a hardware company, but we have the orange box, uh, which you can't buy. Uh, you don't have to pledge, just buy a fire. Uh, I don't have uh, twelve to fifteen thousand dollars bring a hole in my pocket, but I would love to have one of these things. It is twelve Intel nuts in a box um, with uh, the and a gigabit switch uh, back on it. They're i5 CPUs, Intel Graphics 4000, 16 gigs of RAM, 120 gigs of SSD. It's a cluster in a box. It doesn't take up that much space. More, you, know, you can kind of tell by sizing that how big it is. It doesn't take up that much more space than a power. Um, 
And you know, part of it is designed really it's like for demos and sales engineers to come in and show people, you know, like we'll just throw down a Juju and Mask and throw down a cloud in front of you in you know, 10 minutes or less. Um, which is kind of powerful. Um, and it would be really fun to play around with. And boy, uh, you know, effectively you've got 40 cores, 160 gigs of RAM, and 1.2 terabytes of solid state storage on this internal gigabit network. I mean, um, so, I won't be able to this that's really it. Sorry, it's kind of a, a little bit of a laundry list, but which, whatever second you'd like to ask about, feel free to go back to the next